This is a recording of an interview with Grace Thompson on the 31st of January 2004. Grace, would you like to tell us something about yourself? Yes, I was born in Western Turville. My maiden name was Samsworth. I was born at what was then 5 Main Street and is now number 20. I can remember it being renumbered, I can't remember the ins and outs of why. Uh, the house was right opposite the Hay Hall, which has long since been knocked down now. Uh, the Hay Hall was where they held dances and social dues. The Women's Institute used to put on music halls and plays. We had a kinema club used to come to the village where we would see the old films, Laurel and Hardy, etc. This did not go on for very long. It was a, a nine-minute wonder. I was eldest of seven children, uh, my mother being eldest of one of eight children, and her family goes back through the village, living in the village for many, many years, early 1800s, as far as I can make out. Um, my mother's sis one of my mother's sisters actually lived next door. Her other two sisters lived in the village. Well, two of her brothers had lived in the village. Two of her brothers had moved away. Well, one of the brothers had been killed in the Second World War when he was only a youngster anyway, and the other brother had moved away. One of my earliest recollections was when I was just short of two and a half years old, surprising that it may seem. We were going, it was a th must have been a Thursday because we always visited grandmother on a Thursday. Mother's pushing the pram with my baby sister in it and I'm toddling along and all of a sudden mother screams, get under there, and she pushed me under the pram handle. There is an aeroplane, a light, and it couldn't have been more than 20, 30 feet in the air. And it was blazing. And it came across the road where we were walking, missed the top of the tree, and landed in the field, the field that was then behind our house. But it was just a few yards further on, this plane came down in the field, and the pilot was killed. So where were you working, walking from? And to? Oh, this is the point, isn't it? This was on... Just opposite where the memorial, war memorial is now was the point that we were at and this plane came overhead, blazing. Then I suppose after that my second recollection was the celebrations for VE Day. Um, the, the celebrations that were held in the village for VE Day, all the children were dressed up and Mother had uh, collected the flower sacks and she dyed them and she dyed them and Union Jack and made things out of them. My sister went as a bride with one of our cousins going as her groom and all the gear was made up out of these flower sacks. Myself, I went as a chef with a chef's hat and apron again made out of these flower sacks and the the party afterwards, after we'd all walked around the village, was held in what was then called 13 Acres Field, which we always called Barley Close Field. This was on the main street, um, between where we lived on the main street and the Five Bells Public House, the entrance to the field. It was cordoned off and we held a fate in the village. And I was very fortunate because my dad's friend in the army, in his off-duty hours, had made loads of wooden toys, big wooden toys. I had a train which seated four children. This was taken down to the field. The rocking duck, the rocking horse were all taken down to the field and people paid pennies and this all went into the monies required for after-the-war build-ups and things and we had a marvellous day um, 
I, I remember I, because I was a little tomboy, if somebody dared me to do something, I went ahead and did it. So if somebody had dared me to climb a tree, an elm tree, so I did. I got to the top and thought, well, how the dickens do I get down from here? So I just let go and came down. I landed with such a thud on my back that I damaged my back. But it was a case of uh, you go home until it gets better. And then I, as a result of this, I didn't start school until I was nearer to six. Uh, I suppose I was about three months short of being six before I went to school. Is this and because your family couldn't afford medical help? It was more a case of my mother was afraid of anything hospital and uh, therefore you didn't get in the hospital involved in things if you thought you could get away with it, I suppose. Um, whatever, I, I, I remember enjoying school immensely and uh, fortunately we were able to go to school all day then because until a few months previous... We'd have, the village school children only went to school in the mornings because the evacuees, and there were over a hundred of them, had needed the school for school to, for schooling in the afternoons, and that was how we were in, divided the school time up. So Between, where did the evacuees stay in the village? Now, there's a point. They stayed with the families. The evacuees stayed with the families. Uh, my mother had... To begin with, she had Mrs. Reynolds and her two little boys. These all came out of the... I don't know, out of London somewhere. I can't remember exactly where they came from. And uh, nearly everybody that could give a home to a family or children of families gave a home. And we had these two little boys, the two little Reynolds boys, and their mother stayed with us. And then for some reason they went. I think it was because the Blitz in London had finished and then they all went back home, some to come out again later on. And then we had Auntie Ada came to stay with us. Now, Auntie Ada was 90 when she died. She died in 1956. Uh, she was quite an elderly lady when she came to visit, came to stay with us. And her sister husband and daughter were with my aunt who was next door but Aunt Ada stayed with us and when her family went back she wouldn't go she liked it in Western Turbo and she decided she would stay Aunt Ada stayed with us until a few months before she died which was in July 1956 and the reason she went from our house was because there was mum dad and six children all in a three bedroomed house one of the bedrooms of which belonged to Ada so the doctor said we were overcrowded and we must find another home for Ada and at that point Ada went to stay with another of my mother's sisters in Vine Cottage on Church Lane and only months before she died it was Aunt Ada that taught me to knit and I know I was no more than eight years old when I knitted Fair Isle and knitted on four needles. I was quite adept at knitting. I still keep it up. And um, we did a lot of French knitting and all the girls together would see how who could make the longest French knitting and then go in for measuring it. And then the things we could make with French knitting. We made slippers, we made... Table mats. We made all sorts. By <laughs> French knitting, do you mean the uh, bobbins with the, bo with with the, the four cotton, nails? That's and it, the, the cotton reel, the empty cotton reel with the four nails on the top was how we knew French knitting. And another pastime in the village, and I believe my mum had been instrumental in this during the war years, my mum loved jigsaw puzzles, and she set up the jigsaw puzzle club if you like uh, where many people bought a jigsaw and then they got passed round you could keep them as long as you wanted but then 
the next person was always ready to do your one and you were ready to do somebody else's one. It was like a little library of jigsaw puzzles. And that was it was a great social thing where they met up and passed on their jigsaws one to another. And hardly anybody was not involved in this jigsaw thing in the village by the end of the war, as I remember. And Mum was a great card player. She taught me to play all the card games when I was very young so that she'd got somebody to play with. And then we... Our outdoor activities, skipping and playing with two balls or three balls or four balls if they could manage it, and games up against the wall and the rhymes that we used to have. Do you remember Come. any of them? Not really, no. I, I've tried on that one. I can't remember them. It's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and... Did you play marbles? Marbles and five stones was always a great favourite. And hopscotch. And then organised games with netball and played for the school. Not very well, I suppose, but... uh, Oh, one character I remember in the village... A real eccentric old man. He was known as the Holy Joe. I don't know whether it was just the children that called him that, perhaps the parents as well. He used to walk around the village with his sandwich boards and the front of him would be the end of the world is nigh and the back would be prepare to meet thy maker. And he... I don't know, he was just a... just a peculiar old fella. And then, speaking of sandwich boards I suppose takes us to bread well we used to go round to the bakery round Bates Lane where Mr Bates was the baker and you could go to fetch the bread if uh, run out before delivery time and I can remember them deliver them with horse and cart excuse me do you mean Mm -hmm. to say they delivered them to your house they delivered to the house with a horse and cart The, the sons used to come on the cart and bring the bread to the house. One was called Harold. I remember the other one's name that came. They were a large family. And they came, delivered the bread, and if we'd run out of bread before, before the delivery was due, we would be sent round, I think it was four, p, four pence a loaf, a big loaf, and we would go round to fetch the bread. And it would be nothing to have chickens on the table in the house and cows coming through and doing what they'd got to through, do on the floor on their way through. Oh, you want to edit this out. <laughs> and uh, the house was generally filthy, filthy, filthy. And you would find all sorts of bits and pieces in your bread that shouldn't ever be in bread. But uh, the bread, <laughs> if you could get past the nasty bits, was lovely bread. And I always remember, and usually remember, the loaf that you'd gone to fetch became half a loaf by the time you got it home because invariably you'd eaten most of it before you got there. Fresh, warm, still hot, beautiful. And then another story about bread. The Widow's Turpin, Widow Turpin's Charity was bread delivered to the poor of the village or bread given to the poor of the village. I'm pretty sure on four Saturdays in a year, twice in March time, twice October, November, two Saturdays running each time, we would go and we have allocated to us the bread, depending on the amount of people in the family, depending on how much bread you got. And I can remember going with a pillowcase and, and the pram, and putting the pillowcase in the pram, filling it with bread to take home. No, and that doesn't make sense now when you think about it. The bread would have gone off. <laughs> well, it didn't last for six months until the next lot. Um, your name was called out. Uh, it was Mr. and Mrs. Purcell. Mrs. Purcell was in a wheelchair. Mrs. Wheel. Mrs. Purcell sat with the book on her lap, called out the names, how many loaves you were to get. Mr. Purcell handed them down to you. It was being delivered in a van when I remember collecting it. Um, Whereabouts? And this was done at, outside the school, old schoolhouse. I remember when I was small, we went to 
We would go and get some groceries from Mum down to Miss Holt's, which is down West End, which is called the Small House. I used to go in there, and it was just a tiny, tiny little place, low ceilinged. Even as children, you felt you could touch the ceiling. It was so small. And she kept everything you could wish for in the grocery line, green grocery and everything, and she used to weigh up the sugar and put it in little blue bags. And and it was Miss Holt that was our Sunday school teacher, and she was there. She'd been taken in by an aunt years before. She'd grown up in the village. And uh, the aunt had taken the Sunday school and then Miss Holt took over from her when the aunt got too old and the aunt was Mrs Kempster. We had uh, another village at the end of West End on the crossroads. Uh, I don't remember that, but my mother did and she often spoke about Mrs Bunce's shop. And another shop I remember down the brook end was Mr. Mags's. We just called it Mags's. It was at the end of Mill Lane. It was a general store. It's now a bed and breakfast. We went to Mr. Mags's shop. If we'd gone to Miss Holt and find that she hadn't something that was wanted, and we'd have to go down the other end of the village, which seemed like a long walk at the time. Would that be past the pond? And that was passing the pond, yes. About the pond that had the ducks on it, where we skated on the ice in the winter. And that was in the main street? That was in the main street, and you'd go home because you'd fallen in and gotten all in wet, got told off. And in the main street, opposite where I was born, was the post office. It's now called Western House. And there was a Mrs Biddle who kept the post office there. And after Mrs Biddle had died, the post office was then moved to the house which was next to our set of cottages on the same side of the road. There was a Mrs Bonham. Following on from Mrs. Bonham was a Mrs. Knappin. Further down the village, at what is now the entrance to the Middlefield shops, we had a newsagent shop for Mr. and Mrs. Hall, and next door to that was the fish and chip shop. Speaking of Miss Hall, she was our Sunday school teacher. We went to Sunday school at the chapel. Um, we used to have uh, visiting speakers come and then after the the Sunday school lessons we would play games and I remember as I grew older I became a Sunday school teacher in the chapel, in the chapel. I did it for about 18 months I suppose before prior to leaving school and then until the Six or seven months after leaving school, I continued to do it. What age did you leave school? Uh, I was 15 when I left school. 15 just. So you went to Western Turbul School till your what age? Uh, Almost 14 when I left Western Turbul School. And then I went to the Grange. Went to the Grange in September 1954 finished in December 1955 because you finished then after your birthday so I was able to finish because I'd had my 15th birthday already if I hadn't then I'd have had to have gone and done another term if it was in the first few days of the next term or any time after that and did you start work then? And I finished I finished school I believe it, the date was the 19th of December and I went to work on the 28th of December I had Christmas Day and Boxing Day as a holiday. And where was that? And I worked at Antiference in Aylesbury. Which did what? Uh, Antiference made, at that time, all sorts of things, actually. They did um, television aerials was their main line of business, but they diversified making metal furniture, garden chairs, garden tables, etc. 
Did you did you go to the youth club that was in the village at all? And I went to the youth club, which was uh, attached to the church and their Sunday school. And I I started to go to the to the youth club on a Friday because I felt it wasn't fair that my sister could go and I was supposed to be going to night school. So instead of going to night school Tuesdays and Fridays, I started skipping night school after a year to go to the youth club. And that was at the youth club that I met met what was to be my future husband. Was that in the Hague Hall? And uh, the youth club was held in the church hall on Church Lane. And we used to do the usual things, I suppose, the table tennis, there was darts and indoor recreation. I can't remember it being anything very exciting, but it was just just the gathering with the other people from the village. Those Mm -hmm. church rooms, when you were at school during the war, did you go there for your meals? The church hall had been our canteen while we were as school children. And we used to go in, hold hands and go in pairs and go to the church room for our canteen meal. Very good meals as I remember them. Really very good meals. I used to love them. And... uh, How long did you have for lunch then? I believe we had an hour and a half for lunch. So long Because we, we had to get there and have our meal and then get back and then a little play time before going back into school for the afternoon. I remember on school holidays, before the holiday would start, especially the, the long summer holiday, Mr Lawton, the headmaster of the school, would say in assembly, any children that wanted to bring along their packed lunch... And I think the day he chose was Thursdays. Come along to the school, half past ten on a Thursday, say, morning. And we would go for a walk. If it was pouring with rain, don't bother to come because we wouldn't be going. We would set off, we would go maybe up the Maraway, cross over the busy uh, Wendover Road, which in those days wasn't at all busy, and then cross the field follow the railway line going through to Nashley Road, Wendover, as far as the Wendover station, and come back by a different route. We would be collecting wildflowers on the way, which we would then take home and press so that we could keep a record of what we'd seen on that day. Mr Lawton made these things so interesting and so enjoyable that we really looked forward to the the days in the school holidays when we would be going for our walks. What did you take for your packed lunches? And for packed lunches, which he'd told us to bring along, would probably be just bread and jam and a bottle of water. Because, especially ourselves with large families, that was the best mum could render for us. And then... Often the Saturdays, especially through the summer months, there would be fates at different points in the village, the big houses, the open, open the gardens up for the fates. There'd be things like bowling for the pig and throwing darts at a board and get a ten shilling note for your top prize if you happen to hit that bang in the middle. And there would be raffles and tombolas and all the general fate things sometimes we had what would be regarded as important people come along and the girls from the village school would dance around the maypole which the boys had carried to these different venues I remember one time we went as far as a field in Wendover and the boys carrying this great big maypole all the way to Wendover and then when we got there, we we did our dances. We did about, I don't know, eight, ten, twelve dances. And 
apparently these the steps for these dances have been devised by Mrs Lawton who was a teacher at the school wife of Mr Lawton and teacher at the school and she devised the, she choreographed these dances for us to do we used to wear our pretty dresses and have a great deal of fun and we had things like fairs used to visiting fairs travelling fairs used to visit and they used to set up in the playing field in the middle of the school, village where the school is now and we had chair planes and coconut shies and all the different things that the fairs would have had was that being, being allowed to stay out late which would be about half past seven at night so that you could go when the fair started up and uh, would that be once a year or a couple of times a year I only remember it coming a few times, so perhaps it was once a year. I can't remember why it was stopped. There was some dispute about, I suppose, maybe the the mess they made of the ground with the pitching of their tents or something. I don't know. It was stopped. It didn't go on for very long. And then we had events more, more through the winter months in the in the uh, Hague Hall. We had the there would be dances the youth club put on a dance one time and other clubs and women's institute mother's union or whatever they put on dances and I can remember going to music halls in there where I remember them singing the likes of show me the way to go home whatever that one was (laughs) lost it Um, yes it was great fun my knees up and I can remember them having a skiffle group and all these ladies with their washboards doing a, a skiffle group all great fun did your mother do her own washing as she had so many children oh mother did her own washing so yes. what was a wash day like wash days yes we never had we never even had water in the house until I was about Eight. We fetched it from the well, which was in the garden. But a little bit further on from that, we'd got the water in. No heating, no water heating. And we built, used nine bricks. We made three cornered, three brick high arrangement. The primer stove went under there and a tin bucket's placed on top to heat the water that she's going to do her washing in. It involved two or even three wash tubs. You had your soap suds and did your washing in one. You did your rinse in the next one. And you had your blue bag to whiten your whites in the third one. And we had a great big mangle outside where you used to go and take in turns to help put the sheets through. Two people to turn the handle and one to put the sheet in, one to catch it when it came out the other side. Wash days in our house was body clothes, Mum used to call them. It was what you wore, obviously. Body clothes on a Monday, bed clothes and towels on a Friday. So there had to be two wash days. Remember the, the home on the main street? The back door led straight into the living room where we had the black lead range for the cooking it was cook, all the cooking was done on the coal fire of course this depended on the weather as to whether you baked a cake successfully or no the wind blowing in the wrong direction would make the fire roar away and be too hot no wind and you get such a dull fire you couldn't cook anything but however mum managed admirably with all of her cooking then we had the what we called the scullery and the scullery was just flagstone tiling on the floor we had a v- long narrow sink fitted once we got water into the house and uh, we'd use a tin bowl for doing the washing we used three wash bowls for big wash tubs for doing the washing the clothes washing we boiled the water on a heater which was placed over a primer stove 
and you do your washing with your soap suds in one and another purse all and um, I can't remember the name of the other one uh, the there were soap um, flakes soap flakes Lux soap flakes for the woolies and then you had your rinse waters and then your dolly blue which you put through a a third lot of water to whiten up your whites and then it was take the washing out into the back garden where we had a great big mangle and put the washing through the mangle we did our eating mostly in the in the living room especially through the summer months where there was there was you know sort of seven eight of us around the table uh, in the summer months when it was too hot to light the fire any cooking was done on a primer stove and then when I was about between 12 and 13 year old we had some electricity put in so we got our first electric cooker um, remember things about my, what, the lady that we called Aunt Ada of course she was not a relative but children were brought up to call these sort of people aunt and uncle for res reasons of respect in them days she could spin a yarn she could tell us all about the things and she'd been I think she was born uh, late 1830s possibly early 1840s the things she could tell us she can remember people going to the great exhibition of 1851 she was a nanny to the Fry's family. The Fry's, the five sons of the chocolate Fry's family. <laughs> oh, the different things she used to tell us. She was, she was such an interesting person to listen to. The house was rented from Rosemary Cox's parents. Well, I can't remember what the rent was. I think it was seven and six a week. However, in 1959, as sitting tenant, the sitting tenants were offered the chance to buy these three cottages together for the sum of £1,000. I know my dad regretted not doing it. My dad was a, a printer and he worked most of his days for Hunt Barnards in Aylesbury. I can remember him bringing home books that were damaged and therefore couldn't go out. I remember the penguins and the puffins. I was an avid reader. I can remember reading, should I say, should I say such a thing, Lady Chatterley's Lover when I was only eight years old. That was before it was banned. Um... We had Mr. Mr. Robinson. He kept the ducks that were on the duck pond in the village. And he also kept a couple of cows or so. And we used to get our milk delivered. He used to come round with his churn on the carrier on the front of his bicycle. And he'd have a scoop and you'd take your jug and he would scoop your milk out into your jug. Then on mornings when we'd run out of milk so that we could have breakfast before going to school, perhaps be sent down to where Mr Robinson was with the jug to collect the milk, which had probably just come straight from the cow. And Mr Robinson was uh, where the hide is now. Um, oh, there's cars in the village. I can only remember there being about five or six cars and certainly no more than ten I can remember the names of some of the people that had the cars Mr Chamberlain had a car uh, uh, Mrs Riley would have had a car um, there's so many happy memories of the village growing up days I remember the, in particular the May days and the, the dancing at the fates and the fairs, the travelling fairs that used to come to the village. And, oh, 
sitting with Aunt Ada in her room of an evening. She told us so many stories. I just loved being with her. I was just short of 31 when I moved out of the village, to, only to live in Aylesbury. I, I had such a... I have such happy memories. I had such a happy life in the village. I really, really just so sorry that I ever left it. I've often thought about coming back. I'm, I'm near enough now just to pay visits. Grace, that was fantastic. You've got so many super memories and you've really made Western Derville come alive. It was a great pleasure sitting here listening to you. Thank you very much.